Our talk this afternoon is presented by our show partner, Repaint History, an organization focused on bringing underrepresented aspects of art history to the fore. We are lucky to have Repaint History founder, Pega Kargar, here today, who will be joined by a panel of creative women, senior curator, Corey Jackson, gallerist, Erin Stump, biographer and poet, Molly Peacock, and artist, Hasten the Good, um, for a discussion on the question, is a woman's brushstroke worth less than a man's? Please welcome our speakers. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, Artist Project Toronto, and thank you guys for being here. Really, really thrilled to have you. Um, so before we get into I want to introduce our panelists, and um, we'll start with um, Aaron, actually. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron uh, Stum of the Project Gallery. Aaron uh, focuses on contemporary artists as part of her gallery, and she mainly focuses on female artists. So thank you, Erin, for being here. Tayson, Tayson the Good, known in the digital world. Uh, she's an emerging artist, and she actually has a booth right here. We love her work, and we're so happy to have her on the panel. Um, Corey Jackson, Corey Jackson is from uh, RBC. She's a senior curator of RBC, and she focuses on the acquisition uh, of the art pieces for the global uh, collection of RBC, as well as Molly Peacock. Uh, Molly is a poet and a biographer, and it's actually, a, there's a little funny story of how Molly uh, connected with Repaint History. As part of Repaint History, we uh, contribute a portion of ourselves to Sketch Toronto, uh, which is a charity that supports homeless youth. Uh, through the arts and art education. And so Molly and uh, uh, Repaint History connected through that organization and we're so happy to have her here, have all of you guys here. So let's uh, dive in and talk about why we're here today. I'll give you guys a little bit of background about Repaint History. And so Repaint History is a company that uh, focuses on bringing recognition to the past female artists and mainly the forgotten female artists of the past. And so um, the idea started with myself not being able to name three artists from the past. I could think of Monet, Manet, Caravaggio, all these male artists, Picasso, Van Gogh, and I've always been an art enthusiast, an art lover, but when I started thinking of female artists, I was quite a shame of myself for not knowing, not being able to name one. And thank God for Frida. That was the only person I knew. And then, uh, so, so I started doing a ton of research and I found out we had so many amazing female artists um, uh, in the past that they contributed to the art world. They were even pioneers of very specific art movements and art eras, yet they're all attributed to the men. Uh, and somehow their names have been missed throughout history. So that really bothered me and I uh, decided to make a change. And I also want to, before I, we get into it, I want to give a shout out to my co-founder, Jess, who um, she was supposed to be here on stage with us, but uh, she is a mom now. She gave birth four days ago and so she couldn't join us on stage, but she's here in spirit. So. Um, we, it, uh, she might stop by, but anyway, so this, this talk and this conversation is really about that and Repaint History brings the name of female artists uh, through fashion, events like this, and we'll have a pop-up later on which you can see our items. So, without further ado, let's dive into our conversation. Um, as I was saying, throughout history, name of these female artists have always been missed and so many of them were around but all these art movements art eras have been attributed to the men and so molly let's start with you why do you think that is can you give us a little bit of a background what it was like in that time and give us a little bit of a uh, paint a picture for us from that time about female artists um well uh let's just roll back to the 19th century and um and 
uh, prepare yourselves by uh, imagining that, for instance, uh, no woman in this room would be, just this, an imaginary situation, no woman in this room would be allowed on Facebook, okay? So just take that away because there's no women's organizations, there's no women allowed in social clubs, um, there's no women allowed in art organizations. Uh, and, and I just want you to also take a minute to look around at yourselves and see how beautiful you are right in this audience right now. <laughs> this is a gorgeous looking audience and a wonderful crew here, um, not to mention the people uh, with me on this stage. Um, and think, as you're looking uh, about your own selves, your own spirits, what moves you to look at art, what moves you as artists yourselves. And know that the spirits of these women of the past, which I'm gonna drop a few names in about 30 seconds, are here, they're with you, they're in the air. You don't know them maybe, you may not have heard of them maybe, but they are here from the anonymous indigenous women who were making dolls and dresses and blankets on this territory where we are sitting right now to, the, to Mary Ella Dignam, the first name I'm gonna drop, who created the Women's Art Association in 1886. And that is right on Prince Arthur Avenue, still there that, that house is still there and that association is still going. And there'll be a celebration of women artists in their 80s at the Women's Art Association um, in April. My own interest as a poet and a biographer, I wrote a biography of Mary Delaney who invented collage in the 18th century even though your art history book tells you that Picasso and Matisse invented collage, uh, there was a woman doing this and I became enraptured by the, her whole process and what uh, propelled her to do it. And then I decided it's time to do this at home in Canada. And I'm working on a biography of Mary Heister Reed. Mary Heister Reed is, uh, was born in 1854. She practiced, she sold her work. She, was, she had an art studio on King Street and then another art studio on, in the arcade on Young, Young Street. She was painting, she didn't leave a diary, she left hardly any letters. We know about her because she left records of her work, what she painted, the titles, and what she sold them for. So there are these figures, and they, the, the spirits of them exist, and you can go see her work, because Mary Heister Reed was the first woman ever to have a solo show at the AGO. In 1922, the year after she died. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> so Molly, can you uh, talk a little bit about the challenges that female artists during that time faced and what did they have to overcome in order to showcase their work uh, you gave us an example of Mary Cassatt. You gave us an example of Mary Hester Reed. So, give us a little picture. Paint us that kind of picture of the the challenges they had to go through. Um, so you've imagined yourself without any sort of social media outlet. Um, now you can imagine yourselves um, not being able to go to art school because no one is admitting women to art school. Um, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts admitted women uh, in, in the 1870s after the Civil War. And so if you were a painter who, were, who was serious here in Toronto, um, you needed to find your way to Philadelphia. Um, and, then, and later on in the century, um, small art schools started up including one by um, the woman who started the Women's Art Association. Another thing that, that uh, was made your life, I would say, impossible as an artist um, for some people is marrying because 
the property laws would not uh, t so tied you to your husband that um, you, you could not, without his permission, strike out in life. Mary Heister Reed married a fellow artist, George Reed, and you know his work because they are, he did the murals in City Hall. But without that, she had a partnership. And there were some relationships, there were couple artists, and some of them showed in Paris, some of them, uh, there really only was one prominent couple artist here in Toronto, and that was the Reeds in the late 19th century. but. Uh, and then once you were married, so that was one relationship. And this is, I'm speaking about a binary culture, you know, uh, where, uh, uh, what I say, men would say, men were men and women were women and glad of it, that, that kind of culture. So, uh, and then there would come the point where um, if a woman became pregnant and then had children, it was basically, it was all over. And Mary Cassatt understood that just the way Queen Elizabeth I understood that. She refused to get married. Um, but she then lived with her parents her whole life. Uh, so, uh, and she was very well to do. So she could live with her parents in Paris and be friend de gauche. So that was like okay professionally. But um, had she gone the tradition? the quote-unquote traditional route, it wouldn't have happened for her. Thank you, Monica. So, um, Tyson, understanding the um, challenges that these artists had to face 100 years ago and centuries ago, um, the challenges that Molly was referring to, how is it um, 100 years from then on as a female artist, um, have you faced any challenges? Are there... Um, you know, g g tell us about your experience. Okay. How um, has things changed? So first and foremost, I'd have to say, we're allowed on Facebook. <laughs> 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 things have changed, obviously, a lot. Yeah. Like, women were relegated to the home and were doing all of those types of things and had um, responsibilities, gender respons gendered responsibilities when it came to being married and expectations, societal expectations. And now... Mm -hmm. Things have been shaken up, obviously, in the last, I don't know, so many, ever so many years, right? Yeah. And we're in a place right now where we can create um, platforms for ourselves and really have our own voice. Social media, I know, all of the conversation seems to go to social media, but social media has definitely helped in that. Um, but just normal, normal experiences for women, women in general, as artists or not as artists, women as... Uh, contributors to society in terms of being more than just mothers or that sort of thing. I think uh, things have changed a lot in the last, I guess, 50 years. Yeah. And things are continually changing more so where women are doing a lot more. Yes. Um, so then as an artist, for me in particular, you know, I, I, my journey is... My journey is mine. It's interesting in its own story, but we're not here to talk just about me. But um, yeah, the motherhood role comes in and has a play for me, I took a lot of time off before actually diving into my work. That's why I'm an older emerging artist. Not that that's a bad thing or a good thing or whatever. It's just my experience. Um, but but wh where I come from and, and like where, where I am, it's a lot easier to kind of make those choices and say, no, I, I want to create. I want to show. There's platforms like this where I can show. There's platforms like Facebook and Instagram and having websites and that that definitely allows you to connect with a bigger audience and just share your truth, speak what it is that is important to you and you really kind of take it back into your own hands. So I'm sure in history, women were making, there was just maybe no, and they were 100% making and there's history of them or there's records of them making, but there was no way for them maybe to um, get their work out there or shown in institutions or not. My experience with institutions is a little bit less. Well, even over and above that, there were so many women and their names and paintings are, are here showing, as we yeah. go. They made a name for themselves during their time. They it's just had beyond a very their time. prosperous 
career, they they found ways to showcase their work. Right. But it was just... It's just that after they died, yeah. likely it they went into the vault with their grave exactly. or whatever. So exactly. that's the sad thing in that they haven't been made into history books. So yes. now I guess what we're doing is we're speaking about them exactly. a lot more, which I think exactly. what you're doing is really amazing. Um, and so, yeah, I guess you have to create, you have to just keep curating that work. For me, I felt this pull towards communicating visually yes. versus audio aud audibly because I'm not that good with that uh, so uh, that was my pull and you know you have to answer the call if that was your call to do it you've got to just do it and so for me I made that choice to kind of start making work and figuring out how am I going to start showing that work and how mm -hmm. am I going to it's not for fame or anything. It's to get it out and to connect with people. That's, That's right. really what it is. And so I'm just kind of doing it bit by bit. And so my journey, like I said, is very new as I am emerging. Um, but yeah, who knows where it, where it will take me. I always consider I'm playing a long game and not that I'm trying to, you know, be quick with anything. Everything is slow, long, not that long, but it just will take time. It, uh, it unfolds. And That's I'm right. going to be okay with that process of the unfolding. Awesome. Thank you. So, Aaron. This, these changes that we're seeing, that these uh, women, they're having, um, past women, they're having a moment and, you know, some, some, there were acquisitions of some of the past female artists' work and, you know, they're really, we're trying to change the narrative. We're trying to include these women uh, and bring recognition to them. How does that uh, play as a gallery owner how do you, because I know you predominantly showcase female artists' work, and talk, talk to us about that. How are you changing that narrative? Give us a bit of background on that. Yeah, I have a gallery on DuPont, closer, closer, on DuPont, and I show predominantly contemporary Canadian female artists, and when I first opened my gallery, it sort of happened by chance that most of the artists tended to be female. And I think some people aren't aware that coming out of like, especially fine art grab programs, it's about 70% 70, 70 women to 30% men. And then if the history kind of of Canadian or Toronto contemporary galleries tended to be, I think 40, kind of 40 to 70. Yeah, I can kind of speak to that. I was doing a little bit of research in commercial galleries. So I acquire from commercial galleries predominantly when we're looking at work for the corporate collection. And I found a study from 1973, and the female representation was 28% female. And then I redid it just looking online at galleries that we acquire from, and we're now at 33% female. So to look at a gallery that is more than 50% female artists is, is pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah, and so some people think it might have been like a choice, like I made this decision to move the gallery forward in that way, but really what it is is there's so many strong, like younger and, and more senior female artists out there that haven't been properly represented, so that's sort of where it came from. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So, Corey, can you add to that as well in terms of as a, as a senior curator, um, how do you go about uh, representing, making sure that female artists are not underrepresented as part of, as part of yeah. your role how, within the art world? Well, I think for all curators, you know, you're thinking about the art you're, you're wanting to show and contextualize, but with that, you're also thinking about your audience. And for me, a lot of why, when we're looking to acquire, I'm thinking about, well, who's going to be looking at this work? And you know, I work in a corporate environment, but more and more that is a really diverse and inclusive space in terms of who are the people that are going to be spending time with this work and talking about it. And how can I make sure people see themselves in the work? So when I go to galleries, it's looking at that roster, looking at who they're representing. And good galleries have diverse perspectives that they're presenting for people. Um, and I think you know, I'm, not, I'm acquiring work that, you know, isn't just driven by my own bias of what I'm interested in, but how I know that we can engage people in conversations that will excite them. Uh, so that's a kind of a part of how I acquire. And also wanting to make sure that holistically, when you take a step back and look at the collection, that it, 
it has a, a tie and a thread of you know the history of Canadian art, but also an awareness that Canadian art history is shifting in a really exciting way, and that there are more opportunities for exhibitions. I acquire work by artists who are also getting opportunities in museums and galleries. It's important to have that uh, as a part of the artist's kind of CV, that we're supporting artists who are engaged in a larger community. Um, so the more opportunities that I see happening in those regional gallery spaces, like the AGO, who are now showing living female artists, Yay. Um, super exciting. That's a huge shift. And I think we need to acknowledge that. But also, it's because audiences are demanding to see themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I think audiences are now going. Like, I think what we have to, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm diverting here. But if we don't go to see the shows that they're putting on featuring female artists, they're not going to put those shows on. It's like ticket sales. You have to go and see the work. Like, just going to give a plug right now to Micheline Thomas's show at the AGO, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal show uh, that you should go and see, which is currently on. Like, we have to show by our numbers. Consumers have that power, or the audience has that power in any kind of industry. We have, we have power to change based on our action. So that's Absolutely. the action. Absolutely. That's part of the action. Absolutely. Totally agree. So um, I hear really good, you know, insight and really important information and they're all very um, upbeat and makes me very happy as someone who's trying to bring recognition uh, to the past female artists and to make sure that the present and future artists are um, going to be equally mentioned uh, in, within art history. Having said that though, there are some uh, unfortunate stats still out there. For instance, uh, female artists, they still earn 42% uh, less than their male counterpart. And if we think about that, that's larger than wage gap. So, uh, and it's something that we don't really often talk about. Uh, and we need to really acknowledge it and focus on it. And the other thing is that only 13.7% of living artists represented by galleries um, in Europe and North, uh, North America are women. So only 13.7%, which is, you know, and it's so exciting to have someone like Erin on the panel because she predominantly focused on female artists because she wants to change this narrative. And it's something that we really need to, um, art is such a subjective concept that we don't really think of the gender gap. We're, we're, been told um, who is good and who is bad and we just kind of take it but I think as what Tayson was saying as well if we ask for it as a consumer and as someone who's observing uh, art and who's an art enthusiast then um, all the all the players within the art world will have to listen to that and that way we can change the narrative um, sometimes sorry to interrupt but sometimes I think we don't even know what we want until exactly. we see it and so yeah. if there's and this is like the call to the artists within anybody is to then make, because it's very, like sometimes I question myself, why are you making, what's the point, what's the point? Yeah. Is it good enough or whatever? Like all those things that kind of come up as a creator. That's right. But you have to make it, because if you don't, who will, yes. right? And so um, as an artist or as someone who's thinking of starting to make art, you yeah. make it because it could potentially make change and, and right. like move someone. That's right. You know, and I think that that is, that's, that's right. very important. Yeah. yeah. I also want to add on to that because I think you brought up an interesting thing around auction records and just the yes. value of where you know, female artwork stands within yes. that because there is a yes. huge gap. Um, but I think also a big part of that when it drives those numbers is who is it that's also purchasing and acquiring yes. and supporting 100%. these artists? And uh, it, it's interesting. I was talking to a woman named Linda Roddick who works at Waddington's. She's a art, Canadian art historian. Yes. Wonderful. Has done a lot to support um, the histories of female artists as well. And she started a, a patrons group for women who are looking to acquire female collections because there's a lot of, you, you, can't, you can't build a market without collectors who are driving it and who are interested. Absolutely. And I think for, for, especially looking back at historical work, um, there's a lot, there's a huge gap. You look at even artists who are making 50 years ago um, who are on the auction market and their female counterparts, and there is a, this 
divide that reflects what you were speaking to. And to be able to start to close that, you have to build a market for that. And I think that speaks to, again, the power of, of an audience of wanting to see um, contemporary work by female artists, but also looking back historically, what is the legacy of the work that has influenced that? And um, I think it's Im important as you know, audience to go, yeah, go to the galleries, go and talk to commercial galleries and museums when you're there, and asked about, you know, what are they representing? And, and I think also as female consumers, to be conscious of that when you're making choices. Absolutely. Thank you. Molly, did you have uh, thoughts around the stats that we've been talking about sharing? Um, it, it is possible to collect um, these artists, women artists of the past. They are, uh, I mean, they, the, the upside for the younger collector is that you can afford them. Um, if you follow, if you go to Waddington's uh, site um, uh, or you register at Ask Art, for instance, online to follow an artist of the past, you can see their work and sometimes it comes up. And I, I, I actually worry about this. I think, well, um, I, I bought a Mary Heister Reed for under $1,000. Uh, and I thought, am I driving her prices down by doing this? But at the same time, I thought that I'm a poet. I can afford that. And I, so I made, that, I, I, I made that buy. But I think there's a whole, those of you who are interested in, if not building collections, just having your own collection, the, what you're looking at, at on your walls, that's out there, it's available, and you don't have to cruise very far around online to find it and to find, find, your, find your market in yeah. the art history of the past. And I think if you are interested in the past, I know for me it's important to also think, how can you bring that into the contemporary moment, just yeah. knowing that there are so many young female artists making work, and you know, if, if there's a senior female artist that you're really interested in, there's a lot of value in kind of saying, oh, what is it that draws me to this? Is it the, you know, that it's figurative? Is it, this, is it landscape? Is it, uh, does it have a social commentary that I'm interested in? And then look at the younger artists and say, how has that conversation progressed? And how can I bring that into a contemporary conversation as well? I think especially given the context of how we're here, there's a lot of you know, artists who are working with uh, depictions of the female body that historical artists also have. So how can you build uh, a collection that, that speaks to that history as well? I think so, sort of like a take on what Corey was saying is um, there's also a resurgence of a lot of senior female artists that maybe were overlooked. So maybe not like historical, but some women who are maybe in their 50s, like people like Elizabeth McIntosh and like Liz Mager, even Susie Lake, great photographer. Judy but, Chicago. Yeah, who are now, I think, are really being looked at and shown in contemporary galleries and museums. And so I think like, paying attention to that and also realizing that m maybe there was people that at the time their male peers were getting the attention but they were making equally strong work that now it's sort of work from 20 years ago but it's completely in a contemporary conversation with a lot of emerging artists as well yeah and big influences like yeah. i notice a lot of younger painters who maybe had some of these artists as teachers and you can really see the influence in the work and you can see them carrying this legacy of the mentor, having like strong female mentors in the school system. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so this is an open question to all of you. Um, do you see these stats changing? Um, yeah. And this is purely your opinion because as a gallery owner, as an artist, as a curator, as a biographer, it would be very interesting um, to share your insight in terms of these stats exist, we're making improvement, um, but do you see them actually changing? Because I remember two years ago when I was uh, thinking of starting Repaint History, there were lots of talks about all these women are having a renaissance and the past female artists, but then just recently new stats were shared and it seems like we haven't really moved as much as we were hoping. And so. Do you guys, from your perspective, do you see 
um, these stats changing? I think like we just, I don't know if you guys were paying attention, but there was a pie chart up there, which was sort of a good example of, yeah, that one. I think that's so important to note that this is from 2015. So I think even for people who've maybe gone to the AGO this year, if you think of Rebecca Belmore's had a show, McLean Thomas, um, Kara Hamilton has worked, the Kusama show. So even just quickly, if you think of this past year, how many female artists and non-white female artists have had exhibitions. So and that's just a three-year span. Yeah. So, so it's like a big... So I feel like sometimes you worry when things become trendy and of topic or, you know, current. Exactly. And yeah. the, the hope is that, you know, I think we were talking before about having more women in those leadership roles, maybe as curators of a, of a uh, section in a gallery or in different places. Um, if the women are leaders or think that that is, you know, they keep that kind of uh, representation top of mind, then it will continue. But if we look at this as a trend, like some things, then it, it may not. I mean, I, I personally want to see that 3% get a lot bigger. Because like, to, for some, that's like, yeah, that's positive. For me, I'm like, no, that's, this is sad. That's right. It's yeah. sad. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully it does change. But yeah. when the trends, when, they, when they're not looked at as trends or as something that's top of mind and it continues on, then I think that, yeah, there will be change. So I guess the, the, the way to be is to be hopeful for the future, to continue to have these conversations and then it stays top of mind, you Absolutely. know? Yeah, and I think, you know, speaking even all to what it is that Repaint in History is doing, the importance of making visible those conversations. Like, I remember when Canadian Art published this, and I think it really forced the AGO and a number of institutions to have an audience that is really educated and aware of what they're looking at and have those numbers to kind of compare against. Um, so it, there, there has been that shift, and I think in the long term, the only way to make it a continued conversation is to make sure that we keep going back and reevaluating and that the conversation doesn't just end because it's assumed that everyone's on the same page yeah. because it's a constant re-education. I'm looking out here at all of you and thinking about us and I thought about uh, the, the noun and verb hope um, and I'm thinking that hoping has to be combined with doing. That part of these low statistics, and they shock me and enrage me, just tapping into my inner anger here. Um, and what needs to happen is that people need art pals. You need to have an art pal who is encouraging you if you are a maker, and if you are a looker and a watcher, you need to be able to go with your friend to go do that. And you need to educate your children. A lot of this is to take your kids to places they're looking at art, they're looking at art by women, and to, for those, those among us who have spare cash, when you're making those cash decisions, um, are you going to you know, what you're going to spend your money on, it's possible to spend your money on art by Tassine, for instance, um, or by all, so many of the women represented here. All of these things are doing that we need to have a combination of hope and do. Thank you. Amen to that. Yeah. And I'll add to them as well, is um, try learning the name of female artists. If they ask you to name three female artists, you know three male artists. It's very easy to remember them. Just try learning their name. And, but just by the virtue of sharing their names, you're going to start making their names household. You're going to start making them popular. And then you'll impact what's trendy and what's top of mind and keep that conversation going. So it's really, it's really just a matter of taking a moment and just looking them up or w wearing their names, which is what we do at Repaint History. And, so, and then start a conversation um, because people will recognize the name of the male artist 
um, and you're a walking billboard, and then they'll ask you about it. So for instance, I recognize Caravaggio, but who is Artemisia Gentileschi? Which in fact, we call her the badass of the 17th century, so look her up, She's, she was very awesome. Um, so thank you guys so much. This is wonderful. And just as a closing, I just want to, we're gonna open it up to question and then we'll recap it. Um, I know you guys talked about what are some of the things that we can do. Is there anything that you want to add in terms of audience? What is it that we can do to keep, continue the conversation and to make sure that this, um, this doesn't get forgotten again? Go to galleries all year round. Yeah. Don't make this your one experience of art and culture. I think yeah. go to the AGO, go to the galleries, the commercial galleries that fuel the art economy in yeah. Canada and, um, and have the conversations with people there. Yeah. Support artists by, yeah. like um, Molly was saying, using your dollars to purchase or using your mouths to talk about or... I don't know, we live in a viral society, so even sharing, share the work that moves you, tell people why it moves you, and maybe it might move them. It's, it's, things are ripple effects, right? So I feel like that, you do have power, even if you think it's limited. You're maybe not changing the whole system, but little things change over time and cause waves. So I think, uh, I think you can take back that power and do those types of things. <laughs> Um, for me, it's, I think, pushing yourself a little bit. I think sometimes taking, investing, or spending more time with a work that maybe makes you a bit uncomfortable and try to figure out why that is and take risks. I think that will cause some change. Yeah, well, did you want to add? And sorry, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, <laughs> And if the conversation is about female artists and really making that, it's, so we're talking just generally in art, but... Um, for female artists being more conscious about your choices to go and support their opening shows or, um, or like in galleries or, uh, you know, like being conscious about that female um, spotlight. So. Um, there is, there's a confidence level that you need to constantly be aware of in yourself because it dips all the time. All those little questions like, is this good enough? Am I, what am I making? I don't know. All that stuff, that has to be addressed all the time if you are a maker, and it has to be addressed all the time if you are a buyer. Ooh, nobody else is buying this. Can I buy this? There, there is this, that confidence level, you, you have to look at it and go, come on, I mean, just pump it up a little bit. You can do this. And part of doing that is, uh, on my part at any rate, thanking Repaint History because of this is an amazing project Absolutely. and none of us would be here without uh, Pega's drive to make people know artists' names, female artists' names. So thank you, Pega. <laughs> um. Okay, so we're gonna open it up to questions. I don't know if anyone has any questions. We have some time uh, to go through and answer some of your questions. It's Molly, yes? What kind of poetry do you write and where can we find it? You can find my poetry in the Oxford Book of Poetry. You can find my poetry in Canadian anthologies and in American anthologies, too. Um, uh, so it's definitely out there. And um, uh, every winter, I teach a class in New York City about writing poetry about visual art. There's a, lo there's a lot of that. So uh, just a, 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 plug, a plug for poetry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's art. Um, anyone else has any question? Okay. 
Hi, so this is more just like curation. So in the next like 20 years, we're going to see a huge transfer of wealth. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's for curation. So in the next 20 years, we're going to see a huge transfer of wealth uh, to women. So I'm curious as to how curators are already preparing themselves for the emerging market of female buyers. I think actually statistically in Canada, women hold 51% of Canada's wealth right now, which is great. I think um, you know there are organizations that are just also trying to educate and empower those women to be the ones that are making the donations to art institutions and understand and empower them to like ask what it is they want to support. Um, and I think for me, it's helping everyone kind of understand what has been the status quo and um, the value of that, of the financial power that comes with that and how um, you need to be able to ask for things. So I think, you know, curatorially, it's um, acquiring work by female artists. I'm, you know, fortunate to be able to be in a position where I'm able to do that, but then it's also educating people as to why. So um, the more that we can, uh, yeah, bring buyers into galleries who are women to make them feel like they can make educated decisions. It's not that every woman has to acquire work by female artists, but that they understand the whole ecosystem and what it is they're supporting. Um, Toronto actually has a few um, organizations for that that are sort of like helping sort of people understand the commercial market. There's people like uh, Partners in Art and Variant Path. And I'm forgetting, there's another one. Um, that are basically, what they're doing is they're sort of like bringing on mostly women and bringing them to galleries or artist studios to try to sort of show people what's out there and that they're, and it's run by women and mostly for women. So there's, th there's stuff happening now. Thank you. As a visual artist myself, what would I have to do to be recognized by big institutions like a curator from RBC and, you know, art galleries and whatnot? Because sometimes you might not always be going through an art gallery. Sometimes you're your own person doing your own website. Um, and of course, sometimes the competition might be very fierce. Um, and so sometimes you tend to want to do things more on a direct approach. Um, just understanding the business aspect of things as well as the artistic. So um, you might not always have the advantage point of working through an agent or, you know, so just wanted to have some sort of a feedback on that. Yeah, both of you do it. I want to hear the answer too. Um, it's a good question and I get it a lot. I think I want to preface it by saying I do work mostly with commercial galleries. Um, but I think for a lot of artists that aren't in the point where they have a commercial gallery representation, um, a lot of, kind of the value of driving a career can also be done through your network of other artists, through spaces like this. Um, a lot of how I find out about artists isn't always from the galleries or going through museums. It's from other artists telling me about what they're seeing and what they're enjoying um, and where they think there's you know, important conversations being had. And that's also how I think a lot of galleries start to look at who they want to bring in and represent is through, and Aaron can speak to this as well, you know, other artists and people championing each other. Um, so I think, you know, as an artist, especially for a lot of recent graduates, it's so important to keep your network uh, and as an artist, grow your network with artists that you respect, that you feel like there's a shared interest because you're gonna be each other's biggest champions. Um, so uh, you know, it's such an independent practice to be an artist. You're probably in your studio for the most part just making work, but the more you can bring people into that and bring other artists into that, and also bring people who aren't artists into it. So you can kind of think about how do you contextualize this outside of someone who just really knows what it is they're looking at. I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, and Erin, maybe you can speak a little bit more to 
the commercial side as well. Yeah, I think community is the biggest part. I always, when I meet people kind of graduating from school, I think having shared studios, especially leaving from like a school program and then being sort of on your own, working really independently can be alienating. So I also think having these sort of shared larger studios, because when one of your studio mates gets a studio visit, you pretty much do anyways, because we're all so nosy and we peek at everything anyways. Um, but things like going to openings, being supporting other artists, and getting to know like gallerists you can just you can ask people to do studio visits like don't be afraid of that that's normally how i get to know new artists or sort of what corey was saying like other artists recommend artists or even something like this you know get to know the people who are in the booths next to you and you guys can you actually support each other like even how i'm in the how i started working at a gallery was through peers who i went to school with so it's sort of i think you're your peers are the ones that kind of help you the most. And I, I believe you have a studio with a kin. Is that correct? Yeah. So I've done studio visits with a kin groups or done tours with a kin groups, and it gives me a sense of, you know, oh, this is, this is what's happening in that community. Those are the artists that are making. And I think, Erin, you made a really good point, and I, I, it is so important. Talk to the gallerists and talk to people. I think you know they, it, it is an intimidating step to take, especially as you know. But that, that's part of go with a network. I think go with go with your friends. Go to go to openings. Uh, I worked in commercial galleries for a long time, and artists would be like, you know, will you represent me? I'm like, I haven't seen you at the gallery ever. How do you even know this is where you would want to show? Um, so uh, those com those conversations take time. Being a gallerist is like and picking what galleries you're going to work with, it's like choosing family. There's a huge financial but also emotional commitment you want to drive someone's career. So I think as an artist, there's also a responsibility to, to be really present and, and, and be a part of that choice of, you know, what spaces do you want to be engaged in? And I'll just like to add really quickly, um, maybe you're not, you didn't graduate from school and you're doing it the self-taught route that was my situation. I mean, I graduated from a different program many, many, many years ago and then kind of came to this uh, after a long pause. So the community wasn't already there. I felt like I was on an island. I feel sometimes like I'm on an island. But participating in, for example, it, at the Artist Project, they have an untapped competition. I participated in that. And from there, you know, built connections with other untapped artists and um, spent time, like uh, Aaron was saying, with whoever's beside me, my neighbors, and, and really taking the time. It, it's annoying. I live in Maple. I don't live in Toronto. So I have to come down. You actually have to make the effort to come down and see shows, participate, be there, support, while working on your work. And then at some point, where I feel like I'm not there necessarily, but at some point you feel confident to approach gallerists or curators or um, people in the industry who are not necessarily creators or makers, um, but they're a part of the ecosystem, then you, you kind of insert yourself in there. You, it, it does come organically. It, it doesn't happen overnight. Like I had said before, it's a long game. You work on your work, you participate in the community, and then things start to happen. And it's slow. It's one friend this year, another friend another month. It's like it, it takes time. And you know what you like and you know what you want. And then you find relationships. Like today I met someone who we connected over the work. They'll connect over your work. So showing your work is very important because then they'll have an understanding of you a little bit more as well. So that's very, very important, I think. Um, I also want to add to that. Reach out to companies like Repaint History. On our Instagram, we showcase female artists we have on Wednesdays we call it artist crush Wednesday and so we we feature current female artists work on a, through our Instagram channel and then some of these relationships has led to bringing the artists you know into the events that we're hosting or having them you know showcase their work at whatever we're doing or having them on our panel so so that's quite powerful as well because I think communities that they are also support women artists are places that 
you know, can help you with getting your name and getting your work out there as well. All of this, whoa, sorry. All of this presumes that you have fantastic social skills, right? You go, I mean, you go into this opening and then you talk to all these people. Um, I have to say um, that one rule is just to go to the opening and say to yourself, I'm going to speak to one person here and then I can go home if I have to. And I really think it's very, very basic. Um, and, and okay, so you have that. It's really step by step. And the other thing is, um, uh, there are little mutual muse groups that you can be in or start. So you and two or three other artists um, whom you know, you, you have a monthly check-in and you say, okay, this month I'm gonna do this one thing. It's re minimal, minimal requirement, but just constant. And with your friends, and that's, that women are good at that. You can do that. It's really practical. By the end of a year, you'll go, oh, I did these 12 things. I'm in a different place. I went to these openings. I talked to 12 people, uh, you know, and it makes a difference. And the other thing that makes a difference is your website. We got to look at it. And also, yeah, so like, sorry, it's so true. You just said it quietly, but like your social media is where it starts. Like, I'll be very honest. I'll just give a little anecdote about my story. Um, I used to post a lot of different things, blogger style, okay? Uh, that was not me at all. I stopped doing that. Um, and then I, I started a new account just to kind of freely share and not worry about who was looking and what was being seen. And then accidentally one day, I forgot to switch over accounts and I posted on my old account. And just randomly, somebody who is in art saw the work. Like, you have to put your work out there. There's an author in, um, in Austin. Is he from Austin? His name is Austin. Um, Austin Cleon. Uh, he, I think he's from Austin, Texas. He, writes, he has this book called Show Your Work. And we get into our head a lot as artists. And it's so true. You do have to consistently make those choices that you're worth it, that your work is worth it, that it's important to, to keep making and keep showing. But you have to show it and share it. So start there. Show it and share it. Have that kind of presence because that's, like, that's the way people work. Partly it is the in real life conversations, but also it's in part the, the check that they do. Oh, who is that? What is their work all about? You know, that's part of it. It's like an appendage of yourself a little bit. Um, so it's, it, it, I think that it is quite important to have an online presence showing your visual work, especially because online is such a visual world. So be there in that world. Participate in there. Okay? So, any other questions? Um, I, uh, I just want to uh, uh, give you an idea, some something like uh, take you from the community local galleries and uh, to make it more educational to the community to uh, develop uh, that kind of uh, um, activity of art uh, is to um, uh, categorize that work uh, like for example uh, let's do uh, uh, a woman show uh, for uh, mythological painters or uh, um, uh, figurative or photography photography in a certain way that will bring the media to you and the media when it's focused on you maybe the community will will come faster and bring uh, and that uh, also uh, help you to uh, create a lobby for women artists, uh, like getting away from the critiques in the high art, like Guggenheim or whatever. So maybe that's an idea. Just uh, for you. Yeah. Thank you. Did you guys have anything to add to that? Well, yeah, I, I would just add to that. Um, in addition, yeah, group shows I think are really. It's a nice way to start out with showing and sharing, building community. If you're part of group shows, you may not know artists. Maybe somebody didn't invite you to a group show. Why don't you make a group show? Like, 
you can make a group show, right? Yeah, you can do it if you want. So <laughs> you really can kind of do whatever you want, really. Anything goes. So I, I agree with you. Then if, if the, the agenda is to push more female artists, have a full female artist group show or something like that. Like just little, there's a lot of little steps that I guess we can take, but, um, and, and then you kind of just build from there, I think. All right. I think we're good with questions unless I'm missing someone. Okay, good. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for being on a panel today. Thank you Artist Project Toronto for giving us this platform. Uh, we're Repaint History is hosting a pop-up uh, right by the cafe, as well as we'll do an art walk uh, at uh, 3 p.m. today. Thank you guys so much.